Good afternoon, and thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon talking about a very, very important topic. I'm Steve Mackwell, and I'm the Deputy Executive Officer of the American Institute of Physics. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third Delta Phi webinar focused on increasing the diversity in physics and improving its culture. As many of you know, today's webinar builds on the excellent base of the prior two webinars entitled From Passion to Action, Levers and Tools for Making Physics Inclusive and Equitable and Removing Barriers, Physics and HBCU, MSI and PBI Communities. If you're not able to participate in these earlier webinars, I strongly recommend that you view them at the APS website. Uh, the panel today will discuss the AIP National Task Force to Elevate African American Representation in Undergraduate Physics and Astronomy, Team Up, report that was released in early 2020 after their two year study of the experiences of African American physics students. Most importantly, they will focus on next steps in implementing the, rec the recommendations that came from that report as we work to achieve the ambitious goals laid out there. The webinar structure today will begin with a one hour, give or take, review of the team up report and next steps with opportunities for Q&A. After the 10 minute break, uh, we will continue with a panel discussion followed by a second round of questions and answers wrapping up at around 4 p.m. Before I hand off to Jim Gates, I want to say that for me, the team up report was eye opening. Some of the personal stories from black students were heartbreaking. And I will admit that I did not truly appreciate the insidious effect of departmental and university culture on the sense of belonging to minority students. Changing that culture will be hard, but we have a moral obligation to make it right. With that, I will pass the baton to Jim Gates, string theorist, professor of physics at Brown University, and the initiator of this important set of webinars. Jim? Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I'd like to first welcome our audience, and uh, we will try to get through our agenda fairly quickly. Uh, let me, uh, first of all, give you a bit of framing of the webinar. Uh, we will um, be going through some issues, especially related to the team up report, which has been exciting. Uh, this webinar series we call Delta Phi for Change Physics, and the coalition uh, that supports this is listed in your, in your Web page, so I won't go through the list of organizations, but we have a couple of goals that we're trying to achieve. We wanna take advantage of an opportune time to focus the community's attention on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, effective efforts and beyond within this domain. We wanna raise awareness of marginalized experiences in physics. We wanna provide steps for members to participate in constructive ways to change the physics culture. We want to create a platform for marginalized voices and initiatives to speak to the larger physics community and to assist in a broad discipline as a whole, education, deliberations, and undertakings to remove barriers to participation in our field. So for today, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the folks who will be uh, carrying this he uh, heavy load. Uh, first, we have Arlene Modeste Knowles, who will be our moderator. Uh, we also have uh, Professor Mary James as a presenter, uh, Tabitha Dobbins also as a presenter, uh, Dara Norma, Norman, uh, presenter, uh, Sarah Eno as a panelist, and Keith Berktold as a panelist. Now, these are all distinguished peoples, and I would recommend that you go to our webpage to look at their biographies. I'm not mentioning it because I think that the discussion that they have is far more important than anything I have to say about the qualifications they bring to this task. We also wanna let the participants know that you can submit questions throughout the presentations via the Q&A app, which is attached to Zoom. So without further ado, I would like to turn this, uh, these proceedings over to our moderator. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the first speaker that we have is Mary James, and I'd like to turn the conversation over to Mary. Good 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, my name is Mary James, and I'm a professor of physics at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and I was co-chair of the Team Up Task Force. Um, so today I'd like to give you just a very brief introduction to, um, to the Team Up work and the Team Up report. Um, and this brief presentation is no substitute for, um, for actually reading the report. Okay, oh, uh, slide. So uh, first I wanna to talk to you about how we as physicists approach challenging problems. And I'm gonna use as, as an example, um, the, the um, work to create the very first Bose-Einstein condensate for which uh, uh, Carl Weinman and Eric Cornell won the, won the Nobel Prize in physics. So first they identified their goal and their goal was to make a Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, and then the second thing was and that we, this is tacit, we don't usually think of this step, but what they did not do was blame the atoms for not organizing themselves into a Bose-Einstein condensate under whatever conditions felt most natural to the experimenters. Doing so, blaming the atoms would be what we call a deficit model of the atoms, um, that they don't have the capacity or potential to do this thing. Three is understand that it is the experimenter's job to create the environment necessary for the atom's success. Next slide. <clears throat> Four, uh, physicists use data, not stories about what we think is happening to guide us and to gauge our progress and next steps. So in the case of the first Bose-Einstein condensate, this was um, continuous measurements of the temperature and density of the rubidium gas. We didn't. Five, we uh, experimenters have to be resourceful, imaginative, and tenacious in achieving the goal. And very importantly, if you read um, Weinman and Cornell's um, uh, Nobel acceptance speech, they talk a lot about learning from the successes and setbacks of others pursuing this, a similar goal. Next slide. Finally, we use every tool at our disposal to build the environment we need for success. And then we invent some more tools and we realize that success is iterative. So in the case of the Bose-Einstein uh, Bose condensate, um, first of all, they made use of high vacuum technology, which was not enough to get the uh, atoms to the densities and temperatures they needed. They used laser cooling, they used the magneto optical trap, evaporative cooling, and finally a compressed magneto opposite trap. And by combining all of these, they were able to create the condensate. Next slide. Finally, when you are successful, celebrate that success. In the case of Weinman and Cornell, it was, uh, it was the Nobel Prize in physics. Um, and then very importantly, to build on the success that you have. And in the case of the creation of both Einstein condensates, I think everyone would agree that that was a major rebirth of atomic molecular and optical physics. Next slide. So we know how to approach challenging problems. And so um, I wanna use the analogy of creating the Bose-Einstein condensate to, um, to the problem at hand. And first of all, it's to identify a goal. So the team up report calls for, um, after making the case that African-American students are underrepresented um, in the population of students earning bachelor's degrees in physics, and that that underrepresentation is either flat or actually um, worsening. Um, we have identified the goal of doubling the number of African American students earning bachelor's degrees in physics and astronomy by 2030. Uh, this was done, um, we identified this goal earlier in the physics community to simply increase the number, uh, to increase the number of um, undergraduates earning degrees in physics, and the spin up project was created and was wildly successful in um, doubling the number of overall undergraduate physics majors in 10 years. So this is a very similar goal. Second, don't use a deficit model. So um, as demonstrated with statistics in the team up report, African-American students are at this moment successfully earning bachelor's degrees in other quantitative heavy STEM fields. We know that they are interested in and capable of majoring in physics and astronomy. And so if they are not doing so, it is not something intrinsic to them, but something in the environment. 
Uh, next slide. So what we need to do if we want to reach our goal is to create the environment necessary for success. Um, for undergraduates, their experience in their home department is paramount in persisting and thriving in the major and in college. In fact, for undergraduates, the department in which they reside is really their idea of what physics is. They do not have a broader, um, particularly in their early years, they do not have a broader conception of physics, um, the, the, the major laboratories, um, other universities where they might um, also do work. So what, is their, what does their experience look like? Well, the dominant um, aspects of the experience that they have are first and foremost, their courses. So that's where for certainly for them, they think physics happens. And so um, having, those course, uh, having those courses taught by people who are um, fluent in inclusive pedagogical practices and um, are up to date on the literature on uh, teaching physics, particularly introductory physics effectively is very important. Second, their interactions with the faculty, staff, and importantly, their peers in the department, and that those interactions are um, pr productive and successful. Um, that they are granted physics related work opportunities. Many African American students have to work in order to put themselves through college. And working at the 7 Eleven is nowhere near as useful to them as working in a research lab. And finally, social integration. And we'll talk more about that um, in a minute. Uh, next slide. So, and this is, this is very important. Um, that we use the, way, the same way we would use data in a laboratory, that we use the data in order to understand what's happening. And in this case, and I can't emphasize this too much, it took me a long time to learn this. The student experience is the data. It's not what we think about the student experience, but their actual experience. Um, so uh, I, I was given some wise advice back in my 20s, which was someone said to me, um, you can't argue with people about how they feel. Um, and so in this case, how students feel about the environment they're in uh, very much affects their decision of whether to persist, persist in that environment. And so what team up has, so what was the data that the team up team used? Well, first of all, we talked to a lot of students. So we did a student, uh, uh, a student survey involving over 350 students. Um, we went to conferences and held um, uh, focus groups, talked to students individually. And then we also did five site visits to schools, uh, to physics departments that are doing a particularly good job of educating uh, African-American students and seeing them through to the bachelor's degree in physics. So what we learned from collecting all of this data was that there are four essential factors to foster the persistence and success of African-American students. Next slide. The first is that students must develop a strong sense of belonging to the department, defined as their feeling of being a welcomed and contributing member of the department and the larger physics community. So rather than our students feeling like they're running a gauntlet for four years, that they have to continually prove themselves to us that they're worthy of, of breathing air in the building, that we welcome them. And we say that we're um, through all, through, through, our, through both what we say and our actions that we say, we want you to be in this department. We want you to succeed. Um, the second is um, that students need to develop a physics identity. That is, they must perceive themselves as virgin, virgining physicists and astronomers. And that in order for them to see themselves in that light, they must be perceived by both peers and more senior members of the discipline. That is for them, the faculty and staff in the department as future physicists and astronomers. They were actually having conversations with them that tell them that we see them as, uh, the, as future contributors to the field. Next slide. Um, yeah, next slide. Oh, no, no, that's good. Thank you, sorry. Um, the next thing is uh, academic support. So students need academic support along four lines. Um, they need effective classroom teaching and we talked about that briefly before. And then auxiliary support for classroom learning. And that's important, for instance, tutoring, 
um, study groups, this kind of thing. And it's very important that we don't that we do not that we do not make two assumptions. The first is we need to tell our students in no uncertain terms that using auxiliary support is not a is not a measure of failure. It's not a sign of failure, but rather it's a sign of academic savvy. Um, and so that we actually um, champion the use of auxiliary supports, um, help students understand how to form study groups and how to use them effectively. Uh, advi academic advising, um, and that that that, um, will, and I'll have more to say about that in a minute. And and finally, mentoring. All of these delivered from a perspective that centers the students' capabilities and strengths in approaching challenges, rather than a deficit model. Next slide. The fourth essential factor is personal support. And the students really conveyed this, um, uh, really I would say uniformly across all the, the different measures that we used. That we need to acknowledge and celebrate the whole student, including their interests and concerns beyond physics. And particularly for African-American students, this may mean understanding their commitments to their families, understanding their commitments to their community, understanding that they want a sense of purpose beyond just attaining formal knowledge in physics. They want to know how they can use their, that is, they want to know how they can use their physics training to help their broader communities, that we understand the financial stressors that these students face, and that we understand that there are times when they need to direct their energy toward their physical and mental health and wellness. And that we are involved in these, uh, both in telling the students that we welcome them as a whole person. And what we heard uh, many times in um, student comments was that if they mentioned anything outside of physics um, within the physics building, that was some, it was conveyed to them that that lessened their commitment to physics. So if they mentioned that they had a job and they had to go to work um, rather than staying at the lab an extra half hour, um, that was seen as a lack of dedication to their, their physics training and, their, and the field of physics. Um, and so, um, and one of the ways in which we can support them is helping them address their own challenges by helping them use the resources that are available and to increase their self-advocacy. So and this in involves educating ourselves, not that we become counselors or not that we become um, I, um, uh, uh, affinity group uh, home uh, leaders, um, but that we know about those resources and we know how to help the students access them. Next slide. So, um, and then um, going back to the Bose-Einstein analogy, um, the next two tenets were to be resourceful and tenacious in solving the problem and learn from others and bring many approaches to bear. So what can departments do? Again, departments being the front line of um, welcoming our students into the profession and helping them to become proficient both technically and as whole people. Uh, I urge you to read up the team, team up report and particularly if you can arrange to read it as a department, um, that is gonna, that's gonna be particularly effective. Uh, there is a department self-assessment rubric in appendix eight, which I think could be very valuable to you. Um, and then after doing the assessment, I urge you to commit to several readily attainable and several aspirational goals. Again, this is most effectively done as the department does it as a whole. Um, individual champions um, can do some very good work, but eventually um, their effort, they will burn out and their efforts will not be sustained. Um, and then there are some excellent resources in the Team Up Reports Appendix 10 which can help you to learn from, from others. Um, and also consider university-wide or regional collaborations to support your and neighboring institutions prog progress. So what I mean by this is if you're in a larger institution, a university, um, there may be some great things going on um, in terms of creating a welcoming and inclusive environment in the chemistry department or in the electrical engineering department. So learn about, learn from your colleagues in your own institution because they probably they have likely mastered uh, harnessing institution-wide resources to help with these goals. If you're at a smaller institution, it may behoove you to uh, become part of a regional collaboration. For instance, I'm at Reed College, and we have a Northwest collaboration of 
uh, small liberal arts schools, um, and this would be an, a, an effective um, a place to, to, to do work. Um, and next slide. Okay. And finally, um, as we have success in, um, in building more in, a more inclusive environment for African American undergraduates and undergraduates from other marginalized groups, that we acknowledge and reward this, first of all, at the department level, that this is essential departmental work and should be treated as such in terms of the workloads that are given to different members of the department. That we garner support and recognition, that this is particularly for department chairs, that they garner support and recognition from other campus offices and administrators um, so that the work doesn't fall strictly on the shoulders of the physics faculty and staff, and that um, departments and um, institutions work with our professional societies to elevate this initiative and acknowledge leaders in the work. And this webinar is an example um, of um, the commitment of, um, of APS and of course AIP sponsored the, the team up report. Uh, fine, uh, last slide. I uh, just wanna thank you for your attention. And um, next I will be introducing um, the next speaker who is uh, Tabitha Dobbins. Um, hand it over to Tabitha. Well, thank you very much. It's good to see you again, Mary. And it was very nice working with you on the team up report. Hello everyone, my name is Tabitha Dobbins and I'm the Interim Vice President of Research and Dean of the Graduate School at Rowan University. I'm also a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Rowan University. I was a member of the Team Up Task Force that you just heard details about from Mary James. And this was very exciting work for me to be a part of. The part I enjoyed most was the learning I gained from partnering with the sociologists to have a look at how they characterize our problem, the problem of persistently low numbers of African-American or Black students pursuing and completing physics degrees. I wanna thank Arlene, Jim, Kate, Steve, and Simone for the invitation to speak further about the next steps for the team up work and report. You'll hear in the next talk some very concrete next steps from Dara Norman. But here, I want to talk to you about recent NSF rapid grant that we were awarded in partnership with Thomas Searles at Howard University, the American Institute of Physics Statistical Research Center and others in order to examine the impact of campus closures on black students in physics and astronomy disciplines. We already knew that there are persistent barriers that contribute to the low numbers of black students completing the physics degree. And you can read about those in the team up report. After hearing about the disparity in health effects that the pandemic had early on on black and brown communities, in terms of the higher infection and death rates reported, I was interested in looking at this, at looking further at whether these impacts could spill over into impacting some of the findings that we had in the team up report. In fact, um, the early uh, disparities in health effects were attributed to social economic disparities. And it caused me to wonder whether these same social economic disparities would also compound differences in graduation rates, experiences in learning and other educational factors. And so I began to wonder if these factors compounded by COVID-19 campus closures and moved to online would over time affect black students' progress towards physics degrees and essentially stall the impact of the team up recommendations. So if you, um, just to put a timeline on it, the team up report was released in January, I believe it was January 5th of 2020. And you all know the pandemic took hold in around March, the mid March of 2020. So early on during the pandemic, news articles began to document the disorienting effects that students were experiencing. Students were describing the feeling of quote unquote in one article, chaos on campus right now. And they were describing the need to relocate sometimes across the country with one day of notice. 
Some universities with large endowments were able to provide financial assistance to students for their relocation. However, the impacts on low income students is only beginning to be assessed in the literature and still even now. It is speculated that some low income students will not be able to continue their education even after campuses were uh, reopened and are fully reopened. It is really unclear how low income students or colleges and universities with little resources available to aid students will manage to fare in the long term in terms of lasting impacts related to this uh, pandemic crisis. I also began to wonder whether the team up report findings that you see on your screen and that Mary uh, covered of uh, belonging, of physics identity, of academic support, of personal support. And the one I add here is also a sustainability provided by the inclusion of leadership and structures at the institutions. I wondered if these findings would be a good backdrop against which to gauge how robust the infrastructure at our academ academies are situated to handle students in crises. And we know that the team up report provides recommendations to departments and institutions for improving the environments where black students can thrive. So could a new report examining the effect of the pandemic crisis guide those same departments on how to effectively handle personal crises that our students may encounter individually from time to time? Crises such as death of a close family member, serious illness to the student or a close family member, effects of mass incarceration on the student and their families, or, or depo deportation of one or both parents. All of these things can have dramatic effects and represent a crisis in the life of students. So can we use the, um, can we use the findings that we have in terms of how departments were able to manage to support students during the pandemic crisis to also make recommendations on how students can be supported when they experience personal crises. To my knowledge, there are no previous studies addressing these issues with a holistic approach to support students involving all faculty chairs and leadership structures in the process of supporting the students. This suggests a need to develop a new study uh, to help departments colleges and institutions to better serve students and prevent differential effects on historically underrepresented minority students, especially in times of crises. So we use the National Science Foundation rapid mechanism to apply for funding in order to carry out this study because it would permit us to examine problems while the affected population was still able to be found and still able to recount their own experiences. We quickly realized uh, that one year would not be enough to start over and find new aspects related to the pandemic. So we decided early on to utilize the five factors, and that's why I leave them there on your screen. So as I describe how we anticipate those factors can be imp impacted, you have a, a reminder of what they are. So we know that COVID-19 resulted in most colleges and universities closing and moving to online early learning. And within the framework of the team up findings, these transitions have the potential to disrupt the connections to educational support structures, to mentorship, both informal and formal, and to co-curricular activities that typically enrich the students' experiences. In fact, when you consider these five factors, just about all of them would conceivably be impacted one way or another by the campus closure and move to online learning. In framing the problem, we wanted to examine whether the students experience losses in a particular factor. For example, loss of research opportunities might affect belonging and physics identity. If so, what measures could be put in place by departments and institutions that would lead to a recovery from those losses? Likewise, the move to online learning could degrade uh, the effective teaching pedagogy and could also that could also contribute to decreased learning. Well, alternatively, it can also be anticipated that some gains might be experienced. 
I know this is hard to believe, but it is possible. For example, our prior findings indicate, indicated in the team up report that African American students in physics astro and astronomy departments experience social isolation and discouragement more often than their counterparts in other demographic groups. In situations where classroom dynamics and being the quote unquote only one causes a black student to feel isolated and experience a sense of imposter syndrome, the move to online and the ability to turn off the camera could possibly alleviate those impacts. Other anticipated losses paired with the team up factors include for factor four, Financial burdens often require students to work in the public sector in off campus jobs. Now those jobs are either high COVID risk because they have high public interactions or simply gone as we saw with the restaurant closures early on. So this would be a, an impact to factor four. And then we can think about factor five, the leadership in structures at the institution could be more focused on budgetary issues, on COVID campus safety, and simply survival of the institution during the uh, financial portion of the COVID crisis and the financial uncertainty it brings. And that could be harder to gain quote unquote buy-in for new initiatives that might address factors one through four. So these are all things that we want to consider with the work that we're doing in our rapid uh, report. We want to learn what systems and structures can be used to buffer against losses in the cases where students experienced uh, losses because of the move to online. But we also want to learn what worked well. So we began our work in June of 2020 and we are at the fifth month of our study. The core framework will be that among these five factors that you're looking at, we will be able to catalog losses and perhaps catalog gains. We will look for how those losses were efficiently improved by departments. And it is our hope that we can learn from things gained during the pandemic and those will be applicable in other situations where students experience a crisis um, time period in their in their during their academic study. So um, additionally, um, one of the practices that represents gains is, for example, academic advising. At some, at some institutions, they are already reporting increases in the number of appointments and decreases in missed appointments because the appointments are done virtually. So this remote advising could be maintained even after the pandemic ends. Right after the campus closures, society and students were faced with the trauma of the murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Arbery. It is reasonable to expect that these events caused impacts to our five factors as well. For example, it could be the case that belonging is lost in the quote unquote, we are not okay moments of black students feeling the social justice unrest while the instructor just moves ahead with the curriculum without pause. While it is challenging for instructors to acknowledge those societal moments, the isolation of being not okay on that day or that moment, that week even, could be disorienting for the student who is expected to show up and move on as normal. Likewise, Leaderships and structure, excuse me, leadership and structures, structures, um, we, it, with leadership and structures, we realized that nearly every institution published a statement during the protests and unrest. Some published statements admonishing against rioting while not fully demonstrating a, comprehensive, a comprehension of the tragedies which led to the unrest. This sort of faux pas in leadership and structures serves to lose efficacy in creating a supportive environment, policies and structures uh, with that one single faux pas in, in its announcement. We realize that these are tough issues to tackle. Therefore, we're moving ahead with small focus group discussions as the best approach to understanding the student experiences against the complex backdrop of both the pandemic, campus closures with move to online learning and the social justice unrest. 
We have added Simone Hyatt or Adams to the RAPID team for her expertise in conducting focus groups and analyzing the results from them. She will be working with the same framework uh, that we have highlighted, examining gains and losses to these five factors. We want to examine ways in which departments and institutions can increase the efficacy of these five factors or maintain newly discovered practices that represented increases within the context of the environment at the time. Just as with the team up report, these new understandings will be compiled in the, into a report that will be disseminated broadly across the country. The project will advance understanding of how to increase resilience toward degree completion for underrepresented minority populations of students during crises. The importance of gaining these understandings is that lives will be changed and ultimately saved by increasing the relative percentages of these students who enter the technical workforce after completing their bachelor's degree. I thank you for your time and I think I have kept on on schedule with my uh, 15 minutes and I look forward to dialoguing with you all at the Q&A portion. At this stage, I would like to introduce Dara Norman, who will speak more about practical steps from the team up report. Thank you, Dr. Dobbins. And I really look forward to your report and your findings um, on, the, on the study. Um, my name is Dara Norman, and I'm here to talk to you today about next steps uh, with the team up report. We are organizing and uh, organizing implementation workshops, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, those today. I want to thank the speakers for um, uh, inviting me to come and give this talk, and we'll go to the next slide. So my first slide really is just to let you know that these workshops are happening. Uh, we have a date now, January 28th and 29th of 2021, and uh, we have an application out for uh, interested academic departments, physics departments, that physics and astronomy departments that would like to come to these workshops in order to explore um, more about the team up report, its recommendations, and how uh, that um, how those recommendations can be translated into actual activities that the uh, departments can use to increase the numbers of uh, African American students. Uh, receiving degrees in physics and astronomy in, in their own institutions. The application deadline is December 4th, coming up relatively soon. And you can find more information on the, uh, the Team Up Workshops website here. Uh, Arlene Modesta Knowles is our contact person. And please do get in contact with her if you have any questions uh, about the workshops. Next slide, please. I did want to highlight uh, the organizing committee for the workshops. I'm the co-chair of the organizing committee, along with my co-chair, uh, Thomas Searles, who has already been mentioned um, uh, by Dr. Dobbins. And we have a great team working with us of uh, dedicated folks, many of whom were uh, involved directly in the Team Up report and are listed here. I do want to um, acknowledge that um, we have several professional societies who are represented on uh, our uh, within our working group and will be helping us to distribute information and bring our um, our workshops and the uh, the reports that come back from our workshops to all members of these professional societies. So we're really uh, excited to be working with uh, all these different groups. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you some background on the vision for uh, the workshop, for the first workshop. We anticipate that there will be two workshops, um, 
But this vision for the first workshop really comes back to Dr. James, what Dr. James was saying about the, uh, about the Team Up report and its main goal of doubling the number of African-American undergraduate students finishing their degrees uh, in physics and astronomy by the year uh, 2030. And so the main goal for our workshop really is to have uh, the different departments and uh, people attending the workshop contribute to that overall goal. We think it's important that these departments uh, take a look at the culture and race equity in physics education and um, that these issues are discussed at the workshop. It's really imperative that the departments understand where they are relative to the team of goals. And in fact, um, Dr. James talked about the rubric, and that's part of what we're going to be asking uh, the uh, accepted um, participants to, to take a look at their own departments and where they are right now. Uh, we also want to help those departments figure out where they're going and where they need to go to actually fulfill um, this goal of uh, doubling the numbers of African-American students getting bachelor's degrees. And so the workshops will be an opportunity to help them build a framework of understanding for what they need to do over the long haul, um, how they need to adjust their culture in their departments, uh, the things that they need to understand about their students. Where we want to be an opportunity to support those teams for developing their action plans around the frameworks that they build as they uh, learn new things from our, um, uh, from our workshop. And finally, we recognize that if teams, if uh, the universities and the departments do not have the proper leadership teams in place, and that means um, uh, leadership teams that tap into uh, all perspectives, including those of students, they won't um, have a sustainable model for building those action plans around those frameworks. And so we want to make sure that they understand the, the, what their leadership team um, uh, needs to look like in order to build, to build those plans. Next slide, please. So I wanted to mention that we are really focusing in on a few topics at this first workshop. Um, we recognize that there is a large, um, a large uh, infrastructure, or a large uh, um, uh, group of folks who are really looking at the team up, team up report and using the team up report in different ways and highlighting different aspects of the team up report to reach their overall goals, to change the culture in their departments. And when we were thinking about what these workshops should be, we, uh, we looked at um, some niche areas that we wanted to concentrate on um, that are part of the team up report. And they're listed here. We're really focusing in on culture, the culture of the department, and the university, and also the culture of physics and astronomy that might lead to um, African American students not feeling welcome in that culture, and how we need to change the culture in order to bring the students a sense of efficacy, a sense that they really will be the next physicists and astronomers. We wanted to focus in on race equity in STEM and physics education. And we want to have uh, folks attending the uh, workshop understand what really responsive educational practices are and how to implement those good practices for African American students in their departments. We think it's imperative that student experiences be part of understanding the culture in the department and part of uh, trying to change the culture in the department to be more, um, more responsive to those student experiences and making the, um, the atmosphere in those departments really inclusive of the students and um, helping them to achieve their goals and move them on as, as real participants in the field. And finally, we also recognize the importance of data, both data um, 
data for uh, uh, of student experiences, and also the the gathering of metrics. What does your de what does your uh, department do now? What is the what is the culture of your department, and how does the analysis of gathering that data and looking at that data how does that help you to assess and change the culture in your department? And so these are really this is really the philosophy we went to when we started trying to put together um, the the topics that we would be concentrating on at the workshop. Next slide, please. Um, since I'm here doing a little bit of advertising for people to please uh, um, come to the workshops and apply to be part of the workshops, I did want to point out the benefits to the departments for um, being part of the workshops um, beyond uh, just reading the team up report. We're hope we anticipate that being part of these workshops will help develop a deeper understanding of the findings and the recommendations in the, um, in the team up report. We want to um, support departments uh, in assessing their environments and helping them to understand their uh, culture and where they sit um, as far as um, helping African American students complete uh, their their bachelor's degrees. What are they doing that is contributing or detracting from the success of those students? We want to help people develop a better understanding of race equity in academic environments and help them to do better in um, uh, developing their um, how, how their uh, departments function for African American students. We also want to help build Again, these strategic frameworks for actions that will lead to um, uh, degree attainment by African American students. We, um, we expect people to be able to learn about um, opportunities and resources, both at their own universities and outside resources, that they might be able to take advantage of in order to do the important work and to learn from other parts of the community um, beyond physics and astronomy. And finally, we hope to really uh, give people an opportunity who are working in these other, um, uh, with these other groups that are uh, supporting uh, work with the Team Up report, um, uh, different, um, different programs like APS Ideas, like Sea Change, like EP3, these other areas, we're hoping to expand and build on the work that they're doing in those areas to um, uh, in, uh, help to expand uh, the areas that we are concentrating on and, and build on the things they're learning in these, uh, from these other groups. Next slide, please. And finally, um, we're really interested in making this uh, an integral part of what uh, not just the individual um, the individual departments are doing, but the whole cohort of uh, departments who will be attending these workshops. We really want them to become a community, share from each other, um, share information, share experiences, and share challenges, and uh, as well as um, as well as successes. So. We're asking uh, the attendees of the first workshop to uh, do a little bit of pre-work um, uh, before they come to the workshop. So we'll be asking them again to read the team up report, to do um, a self-assessment and some reflection on uh, what their departments look like now. We're going to ask them to collect some data so that they can start to see how those data really are a reflection of the culture in the departments. And we'll have some uh, self-educational readings that will reflect back to the topics that I mentioned earlier. Uh, folks will, uh, uh, will from the departments will come to the first workshop, and we encourage them to have very large teams that encompass many participants in their departments to read the um, uh, read and do the work in the uh, the pre-work, but. Uh, unfortunately, because we're online and because um, we need to keep um, some of the discussions smaller, we're asking 
three members, up to three members from each of the teams to attend the workshops. Since we'll have recordings and we'll have um, information online, uh, we hope that those groups will get together with their larger group uh, to bring the information and maybe review the information together um, uh, before and after the workshop. We want these department, departmental groups to engage with the Team Up project team and also with each other. And we're going to provide online opportunities for that engagement um, and also uh, opportunities for them to share information, share their frameworks, their structures, their challenges. We would like um, the departments to commit to developing and refining their strategic plans in this two-day workshop. We're not going to probably get to where they have a refined strategic plan, but they'll have the framework for that plan and they'll be able to build on that framework between um, the workshops. And we anticipate that there'll be a second workshop for people to share their findings, to share their lessons learned um, um, among the cohort and also likely uh, with, with other folks uh, who can join that second workshop. We're hoping that the second workshop will possibly be at the the end of the summer in uh, 2021. And next slide, I believe that's the last slide. And so I'm happy to take questions along with um, the rest of the speakers in this, uh, in this first section. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of these, the great speakers. Um, we have a lot of great questions. Um, so I'm going to put this question out to all of you. Uh, do we know how to measure, assess, evaluate culture within a physics department in ways that can be used to track changes and, and the evolution of that culture toward a goal? In other words, how would we know if a department has progressed toward and achieved an anti-racist culture? And that's for anyone. Um, I'll speak up first. I imagine that some of uh, the other presenters would like to also answer this question. And I, I, I opened with the statement of how wonderful it was to be on the um, Team Up Task Force uh, because of the interaction uh, with the uh, social scientists, the sociologists on the team. And um, this was something that was brand new to me. And well, not brand new at Rowan University, we had begun uh, communications with sociologists and the sociologists were are very engaged with our uh, College of Engineering and had held just one or two workshops. But what I would like to give you guys the message of is not to do it yourselves as a physics department, but partner with the experts, partner with the sociologists. They will understand um, how to undertake the study. They can be within your institution or outside of your institution. And, and what you have to do is then make the commitment that they can um, do that work over the long-term if you're interested in tracking uh, your long-term goals. So you make a decision to, to to do the work over the long term and to support the sociologists in, um, in interacting with your department over the long term, but then you step aside and really let them do the work. Any other panelists? Sure, I have a quick uh, comment. Um, I, I definitely agree with uh, Dr. Dobbins. Um, we, um, we have to be able to measure um, as, um, as uh, I really liked uh, Dr. James's analogy, we really do need to be able to measure um, what, the ch what changes are occurring and, and how they're occurring. And um, so we need to uh, go back to the student stories. We want to look at what the student stories are before we've done this work. And we want to look at the student experiences after we've uh, begun starting to do this work. We need to um, take a look at uh, what are the things that we're doing now and compare them with um, the things that uh, both we want to do, but how we're really uh, building our structures, changing our structures, changing how we do business changing um, what our, our values are, what our goals are, what our, um, what our traditions are in our departments, um, and what our norms are. 
what's normal for your department uh, right now, and does that need to change? How how much are you supporting uh, things like um, uh, making sure that students understand that getting auxiliary support is an important um, uh, way to demonstrate your resourcefulness. It's not, it's not hampering you. It doesn't say that you're not qualified. It says you have resourcefulness. You're able to recognize where you need support, and you're able to go and do that, do that work. Collaboration is one of the, the, the hallmarks of how physics gets done. And working with, within your student groups to solve problem sets demonstrates that um, you're doing, uh, doing that kind of collaborative work, right? And so it should be rewarded. Uh, when uh, students do that. So are you supporting those things uh, now? And if not, should you be supporting those things? And that's how we'll start to see our cultures changing. Yeah, I, I'd like to add that. Um, I think for physicists, it's really hard to understand that or to, to really grasp that qualitative data is data. Um, and so I think we, and so what um, Tabitha was saying earlier about um, enlisting the help and support of sociologists, um, that, I, that doesn't mean, I'm, I, I hope I'm not speaking incorrectly for Tabitha, but it doesn't mean turning the whole thing over to them and having no idea what's going on and then having them give you something back, but rather that you work with them to understand the nature of qualitative data how they um, go about collecting it, how they go about analyzing it, how they go about making conclusions from it. Um, and um, uh, so that you're really in partnership with them um, rather than feeling like um, there's some black box over there and somebody's gonna tell you something from that black box. Cause I don't, I don't think that works for physicists. Yeah, I, Mary, I agree. I did not intend to give the impression. This is Tabitha again. I don't see my photo, but um, I didn't want to give the impression that you just step aside. But what I was pushing back against is this inclination that we can do the study ourselves. And we tend to, um, because we because we understand how to how to set up experiments, how to how to perform studies, we tend to think that we should be carrying out these types of studies as well. And again, I'll just uh, echo what Mary uh, started with, that, that the sociologists really understand the techniques. And so no, you shouldn't just step that far away that you just don't know what's going on at all, but you shouldn't be uh, uh, implementing, um, deciding that you're going to implement these solutions without letting the sociologists really have a strong voice in what you're doing. And that's, that's where I was coming from. Thank you all for that very thorough um, response to that question. I have a question for Mary. Um, so can you, you had talked about auxiliary support. Can you define auxiliary support? Yeah, I think, um, so what we're talking about is um, helping students understand that um, using the resources that are available to them is really, are really important. Um, I could recommend a wonderful book called The Privileged Poor by Jack Abrahams. Um, and he talks about first generation of college and low socioeconomic status um, students, what they, bring, what they bring to college. And they often, um, the way, if, particularly if they went to a less well-resourced high school, um, it was their strategy for 13 years had been um, to keep their head down, work really hard, work by themselves, push through, and now they're, they're in college. And they, this has been a successful strategy for them. And so they continue to think that I'm supposed to do absolutely everything myself. Um, and now they're in an environment where that's actually not appropriate as uh, I think it was Tabitha just said, uh, physicists collaborate on everything. Um, and so helping them understand that um, using resources such as tutoring, um, working in study, how to form and um, be effective in a study group, um, how to learn from uh, near peers, that is students who took the course last year um, and are hanging around in the student lounge. Um, so both these formal and um, less formal um, 
uh, uh, resources for um, supporting their academic work, to, what they're thinking is that if I, if I use any of those resources, I have failed as opposed to if I use those resources, I am a savvy student, I'm an effective student. And, and so, and I, I think we have to say that really explicitly to them, not just, you know, say, hey, get a tutor, but say, it's a really smart move to get a tutor. And let's go on the website together um, where you, um, you know, where you click in and sign up to say you want a tutor. And then I'm going to get back to you in a couple of days and see whether you've gotten a tutor. Um, so these are real these are real hurdles for students, and also I think what we need to do as as physics advisors and mentors is to understand that these are actually skills, and as important as it is for them to learn Newton's three laws, it's important for them to learn these skills. They need both sets of skills to be successful physicists. Does that answer your question, Arlene? I think so. Absolutely. Thank you. Now we have some questions for Dara about who can be part of the team up workshops. Um, what should departmental teams consist of? And if a departmental team is working with the APS idea, uh, would it be appropriate for them to work with team up? So I want to say that we encourage all kinds of departments to, um, to send in applications. Um, the main thing is that we want departments that are really serious about and uh, are willing to be engaged with the idea of uh, uh, supporting the team up goals within their own department. So that is doubling, uh, well, the team up goal is doubling the number of African American students who um, finish degrees in um, uh, bachelor's degrees in physics and astronomy. So any department that wants to increase their numbers in this area, we encourage them to, to apply. We encourage them to come. Um, as I said, we recognize that there are some people who are involved with some other, uh, other um, uh, groups that are also working in the team up goals. And we hope that um, our workshop will uh, be a complement to these other areas that people are working in. And so we definitely um, would, would like to have you apply and, um, and you know, use all of the information that you're learning in all of these different workshops, wherever they're focusing, to um, bring information to bear on achieving the goals that you will set up for yourself um, for increasing those numbers and really changing the culture of your department. So yes, please apply. Um, we, uh, uh, I guess the other part of that question was who should be on the teams. We would really, uh, we absolutely would like to have um, the, uh, 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 the chair of the department on the teams. We recognize that at some uh, level, if you don't have the support of your chair in the department, then it's very hard to make change. We also want to encourage that you have student voices on those teams, as well as faculty uh, voices. So we really, we actually encourage the teams to be larger than the number of people we can support um, at the actual workshops. Because we think that in order for you to have buy-in and sustain uh, a real comprehensive action um, plan in the end, you're going to need buy-in from all sectors of your community and all sectors of your department. And I personally also think it's useful to even at some level have some naysayers on your team because then you know to how to address those issues that are inevitably going to come up about why are we doing this. And sometimes the naysayers can give you, can give you the feedback to really enable you to address those issues uh, head on, right, and be ready to address them with other people um, who are maybe not involved. So a wide range of perspectives you need on your teams. And speaking of naysayers, they were, there was a question about how to deal with uh, faculty who don't buy into this and don't think that this is an important um, activity for them to be engaged in. And I wanted to just put that out to the whole panel. Um, how do you deal with, with 
faculty who are like that in your department when you wanna make culture change. I uh, will take the question first. And um, what I, um, what I think, and this was um, this was one of the things discussed in the team up report, was that the idea of a lone champion is really not the way to go. the The lone champion can do a great deal of good for the department, just leaving it to one faculty member who then handles all the all the concerns of the students from minoritized populations. But that's not really the way to go. It's, it's a, a risk because if that person retires or leaves or any other thing happens, you lose all the gains that the department uh, acquired. So, so ultimately, you, you want it to be more of a department effort. So the, but, but I realize I haven't answered the question because it's getting at if you have a five member department, is it good enough to just have three and one of the other two just doesn't want to be bothered with these topics. And for that, I, I really don't know or how do you deal with the, the other two who don't want to be bothered with, um, with working on this. Um, I think the I think you really have to assess, and this is where again it really the the department culture and having the partnership with sociologists who can help you. You have to assess whether the um, whether there is damage being done by the um, by the attitudes of those who don't want to be bothered with the topic, or whether it's just nebulous as flat. It doesn't have much impact at all. That's my only thoughts on the on the topic at this point. Yeah, I do think that what we're talking about is cultural uh, cultural shift, and that's um, there's always going to be resistance to that. Um, people are comfortable with the ways they've done things, and 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 see themselves as as um, uh, you know most physics professors like to think of themselves as good physics professors, um, and so it's it's very hard to to think about well maybe the things I've been doing that I that I feel warm and fuzzy about um, actually haven't been effective. And um, so, so that's, that's, that's a hard barrier to get across right there. So the way I think of it is um, what you really want is a, a shift in, in the center. You want to shift in the center. That is, you, as, as we spoke about before, you want to change norms. There's always going to be outliers on either side of norms. Um, but so if you, um, uh, if you're able to bring along a critical mass of your department um, and they're willing to do the work, they may resent the fact that one or two other or maybe more faculty members aren't engaging in the work, but that's always true in our departments. Um, there are always people that just don't want to do something and we resent them and we get the work done. So this isn't any different. One other thing I want to bring up is an incentives, right? Um, uh, as Mary was just saying, like shifting the shifting how the department operates to um, to uh, you know changing the center actually enables people to see what gains they can make right because they've changed that center whether it be in opportunities for funding coming in whether it be for um, increased uh, recognition of um, the the work you're doing. Um, with African American students, there are all kinds of incentives that might um, uh, come about from making those cultural shifts. And I think as people see that, um, you know, some of these shifts are good for the department, um, you start to bring on folks who were uh, maybe not quite the extreme, but were at the edge of not being want uh, not wanting to be bothered. You bring them along uh, because things start to be better for the department. And I think that um, as we improve uh, uh, opportunities and the things we're doing in the culture to, to make it better for African American students, ultimately we're making the department better because we're talking about things that are really affecting everybody in the department. It's just that you know the African American students are the canaries in the coal mine, as it were. Yeah, I think that's that's a really excellent point that, you know, the, the people who do diversity, equity, inclusion work, we talk about universal design a lot, that when you make things better, when you make structures and systems better for one group, 
um, you actually make them better for everyone, including the white men. So these are going to be better departments across the board, not just more welcoming places for African, uh, African American students. Another thing I just want to come back to something I said in my talk, which was it's important for department leadership to treat this work as work, as department work, and to give appropriate, um, you know, whatever, what, however department work um, gets rewarded, whether it's uh, course releases or what, what have you, um, that this work is, is seen the same as other, um, uh, other important departmental work and treated as such. Thank you so much. This is the end of the first segment, Q&A, but we have many, many questions and we have another Q&A segment uh, later on so we can perhaps uh, save some of those questions for later. In the meantime, we're gonna take a 10 minute break and then we will come back at 3.20. Please, please come back and join us. It's time to begin. Oh, thank you very much. Well, folks, uh, first of all, I want to thank our audience members because in fact, uh, we have counters at the bottom of each screen and you can see the number of participants. We hit a high around 340 or so today and we still have over 286 participants online. So I wanna thank you all for your persistence. Uh, we think that we're making the attempt to provide you with valuable information and we need to reach out and have you in partners in this effort. Uh, I've told a number of people that if we're gonna change physics, it's gonna be physicists who change physics, not outsiders. And I think today's presentations have been wonderfully aimed at who we are. We like data. We like to be able to measure things. Uh, you know, uh, one of the examples uh, that we can build on is uh, the, the, uh, the uh, harmonic oscillator, the forced harmonic oscillator with, re, uh, with the uh, in, uh, frictional force. We all know what that, what that response function looks like. You got to hit the resonance actually to get the peak. And that's what we're trying to do here. So thank you so much for uh, attending. And I hope we're hitting that resonance peak with our audience. Okay, so in the next part of this presentation today, we're going to do something different. Uh, so far, you have heard from the people who have been sort of the, I think of them as a theorist. You know, theorists like to think they understand everything. They have these quote unquote theories. But of course, physics doesn't, is not what I call a faith-based operation. In fact, we like data and we like measurement. So what we're going to do now is to turn to two people who are out there really beginning the process of implementing these theories to see how they might be realized. So we have two speakers. Uh, we have Sarah Eno, uh, who will uh, speak to us for approximately uh, 15 minutes. And then we have uh, Keith Bechtel, who will, who will give you his experience. So as I said, these are people who are involved with actually trying to see if these theories hold water and can they work in departments. So I'd like now to turn, uh, turn the uh, microphone, at least the virtual microphone, over to uh, Sarah. And uh, let's see what she has to tell us. All right, is somebody going to share my slides or do I share them? All right, thank you. So I'm going to talk about some initial steps we are taking at the University of Maryland toward the implementation of the team up recommendations. So if you can go to the next slide. So our, we're at the University of Maryland, we're a very large department. We have uh, close to 60 physics faculty member uh, sometime around in June, our associate chair for undergraduate education, Carter Hall, became aware of the team up report. In July, he sent out an invitation to our large faculty, inviting us to join in a group that would be reading the team up report, meeting regularly, and brainstorming about ideas that where we could implement its recommendations, understand the implement, uh, recommendations, and implement them. Um, Three faculty members responded uh, and agreed to join the committee. Uh, myself, Peter Shawhan, who is in charge of our climate committee, and uh, Professor Wendell Hill, who is African-American. Uh, also a research scientist, Dr. Chandra Turpin joined. Uh, later, after a couple of meetings, our, the staff of our student services group, we're a big enough department that we have professionals uh, in our student services department joined it as well. 
Uh, so just for this initial part, one lesson learned is, you know, if you want to involve the faculty in this kind of effort, asking for volunteers may, may not be the way to, to get maximum uh, number of people involved in these things. And another thing I did find interesting is that the University of Maryland is actually featured in the team up report. We had a visit during 2018 and the findings uh, make up part of the findings of this report. However, as, as far as I know, except for uh, Peter Shahan, who's in charge of the climate committee, none of the faculty members were aware of this report or that we had been featured in it. And I think it, you know, with these large departments, there are pros and cons between keeping this kind of activity in the hands of a, a dedicated and uh, educated group of professionals who are doing this, or as opposed to trying to involve the, the large body of the faculty. And I, I think it's something that should be a conscious choice. You know, you should, should think about it and, and make sure they realize that you are actually making a decision when, when you do these things, because it is very easy for the faculty to become, feel uh, quite disconnected from these kinds of efforts. Uh, next slide. So, so far our group has met six times and uh, our first goal was to assess ourselves, the, uh, the status of black students in our department, and then also to make a, a list of what we thought were achievable action items, things that we could do in the department without significant help from anyone outside because that kind of significant help, of course, takes a much longer time scale and is much harder to do. Um, we certainly, you know, reviewed the thing and we, we were very happy to see that uh, uh, we reviewed well in the team of up report and also that, you know, our student services group, uh, the faculty, staff that are there have actually implemented a number of programs that may not be that well known among with the actual faculty members uh, that are reaching out and, and trying to implement some of the, the things that are in this report. So, so these were very good things. Um, we also did see ways where we could align ourselves better. And we started to make a list. Uh, we have a long list from, from our brainstorming of things that we could do to, to do better. Uh, for our very last meeting, we brought in the department chair and he is supportive and is trying to do that. Especially we wanted to focus on, on two areas. One important uh, thing that we noticed in the report is trying to increase financial support because students who are working full time May, may find it challenging to, to uh, find enough time to do a physics curriculum. And of course, uh, promoting a welcoming environment. We've heard the importance of that in previous uh, talks. Next slide. So, so uh, one thing we are considering is reapplying for an STEM award. Uh, uh, of course, you've heard Jim Gates uh, in introducing us and, and is the uh, founding in, of these webinars. And he, when he was here at the University of Maryland, before he went to Brown, we had one, but it has expired. This was a very useful program that actually gave us quite a bit of money. It cannot be specifically targeted at black students right now, um, but it's still a way to reach low income students. And, and that is, can be also a way to increase uh, uh, black students. Another thing we are considering is having a one day workshop for incoming freshmen before their freshman year that have high math scores encouraging them to take physics during their, their freshman year. Um, a, a lot of students, when they come to university, they, they may not have thought about physics. This is something that is mentioned in the team of report that many, especially black students, haven't even considered the possibility of physics. So we wanted to bring it to their attention. But we also know it's very hard that if a student doesn't take any physics in their first year, it's hard to move into the major because there are so many requirements. So we're thinking about having this one day workshop um, we, we, we do have a new climate committee. It was created for other reasons, but this is one thing they can also work on is implementing the things about the environment and um, the culture that we've heard in the previous talks. Uh, next slide. An interesting thing we learned is um, about work study programs. There's a federal work study program and in our department, this has typically led to jobs um, you know, in shipping and receiving or in the finance office. Uh, one thing I had learned from a particularly enterprising student is that if you, you can actually, if you write an ad and put it out to the work study, you can actually hire students to work in your lab. And this is a win-win for the faculty because you, you get free, a free student working in your lab and the student can earn their education 
um, doing things that are more furthering their career goal than the typical job they would have gotten through work study. So this is something that we're gonna work on. Uh, the University of Maryland is in a predominantly black county. And so we're, we're trying to think of ways we can work, reach out to our local high schools, uh, mo most of which the vast majority are, are predominantly black and, and see if we can do some work there to encourage students to consider physics as a career. And then another thing, as I said, it is true that more black students are going into computer science and engineering, but when they learn about physics, they, they, they may want to move into physics because it's, you know, it is a very nice career for many people. And so we're thinking of creating a new physics tract that would be have less course requirements and therefore people who are moving into physics on their sophomore year would be able to complete the degree in four years because we don't want to add to their financial burden by adding a fifth year. And we hope this, uh, this may, may help move people in. And so this is, this is what we've done so far. And um, uh, I'll let, let go, uh, and I'm done. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sarah. This is Jim. I misspoke badly when I talked about the time. So uh, Keith, uh, you have approximately five minutes if we keep the schedule. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm Keith Bechtel. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and I'll talk about changes or uh, changes that we're attempting to make both within the physics department and also uh, within the Vera C. Rubin uh, Observatory, which is a large science collaboration. So if you go forward one slide. Uh, so one of the questions that was posed to the panelists today uh, was asking why we felt uh, compelled uh, to, to work on these issues. And it, you know, at least for me, I'll try to answer this in a, in a personal way is that I, I, I feel very much like confronting anti-Black racism is a social justice issue. I mean, it's often talked about in the standpoint of making physics better. And I, I certainly agree with that, um, but I think it's also uh, you know, essential to keep centered, uh, just recognizing the common humanity, common uh, interests and aspirations. Um, and I drew a lot of inspiration um, from Brian Nord, uh, Chandra Prescott-Weinstein, uh, Dara Norman, Brittany Kamai, and others in particular, um, you know, Brian sent out a very courageous um, and very impactful, very direct and personal message uh, to the Dark Energy uh, Survey Science Collaboration this summer. Um, and I, I mean, I, I consider all of these people to be both my professional colleagues, but uh, also my friends. And I felt like I needed to do more to be um, a better ally. And so I feel like much of this sort of coincides with my own sort of um, growing responsibility and growing sense of individual accountability on many different levels, um, becoming a parent, becoming an educator, uh, a mentor, a PI on research grants. Um, and I think what, you know, the team up report really, you know, struck me this year um, in part because I felt like it, it it was, it gave me a way of thinking about um, effective action on equity inclusion as a skill that can be learned and something that I could improve upon. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a quote um, from Jedida Eisler um, that I think is particularly important. And, and this is actually uh, one of, it, it comes from a reading that I've actually uh, given to students in the undergraduate uh, courses that I've been uh, teaching. Um, and I think it's really uh, illuminating for many of the students who haven't thought about this quite so pointedly before. So if you go forward one slide. Um, first, I'll talk uh, briefly about uh, some steps we're doing at the, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Physics Department. Uh, one slide forward, please. So one example that's directly motivated by the team up report uh, is that we have an idea to use uh, some discretionary department funds on the order of say $10,000 or so uh, to establish research scholarships that are specifically aimed at, uh, at, at uh, undergraduate students from marginalized groups in physics. Uh, the whole idea here is that these paid research internships could help to address uh, some of these financial challenges, um, to enhance physics identity, to build stronger connections uh, with faculty, opportunities for mentoring and career support. Um, one, one of the uh, ideas of this that I think is maybe important and distinctive is that we would attach, we would attach this to the student rather than to the advisor so that it almost acts like a kind of research voucher 
uh, where you know, the student can initiate um, and then have some more flexibility to choose the research group. And hopefully they, they feel more empowered in, in the process. And at the same time, we would try to have faculty mentors uh, participating um, in department readings and discussion groups. So it's sort of a, a compliment. Uh, forward one side, please. Um, another example of where I've been trying to make changes in my own teaching is that uh, this semester I decided to dedicate a full class period to discussion of diversity, equity, and inclusion topics. And it actually included uh, readings uh, selected from the team up report. And you know, I was a little bit nervous about doing this and holding this discussion because it was something that was, uh, that was new for me. But the students really reacted in a very positive way. And I think many, many of them were really thirsting and seeking this kind of information and, and weren't sure uh, where to find it. Um, so I think that was actually very impactful and it, it really raised a lot of discussion. Um, another change that I've been making is that I'm, I'm currently teaching an introduction to modern physics class for physics majors. And for many years, this has been taught um, where there's a, a culminating final exam and at the end of the semester. And I recently changed this to actually be a, a written uh, final project, a final report. And I've found that what's, I mean, it's been an interesting change where I feel like many of the students it really sort of opens up their creativity. I, I allow them to choose a physics experiment or technological application of their choice. And they really rise to the occasion and it's opened up a lot of, uh, you know, many more students, you know, wanting to talk with me, wanting to come to office hours. Um, I, I try to set it up with multiple checkpoints and opportunities uh, for feedback uh, throughout the semester. And that's really been very positive. Uh, forward one slide, please. There's many more um, activities in the department that I won't have time to talk about today, but I wanted to include these um, for reference. Um, one more slide, please. So hopefully if there's just a, a minute or two left, I'll, I'll just say very briefly uh, about the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Um, one more slide, please. So the, the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, it's a major ground-based uh, facility for astronomy in the 2020s. Uh, it has a very open data policy um, in terms of uh, the data being accessible to professional scientists and student researchers um, from all U.S. institutions. Um, we expect there to be thousands of users and there to be a very broad uh, scientific base, you know, everyone working from early universe cosmology to near-Earth asteroids. And so at the this summer at our annual project and community meeting, we organized a dedicated plenary session specifically motivated by the team up report where we where we proposed a long-term goal uh, and we introduced a theory of change process, basically following the, the change management, management chapter of the team up report. And what we're doing is now following this up by having a series of, of ongoing monthly meetings. And because we're just such a large scientific community, we've tried to organize this into different, um, what we've been calling spheres of influence uh, that really try to bring in all different uh, you know, corners of our of our community and make everyone feel like they are, they are engaged in some way. Um, if you go forward one slide, uh, this is an example of uh, one of these uh, logical flow charts where we've actually been trying to develop this theory of change. And uh, this particular one was for the admissions and the hiring process. And you know, we've in, in engaging these discussions, it's really opened up a lot of questions. It's really, I feel like, focused our thinking and it's been very valuable even at this early stage. Um, one of the learning uh, one of the learning moments for us was realizing that we really had to sort of create this infrastructure to hold these discussions. We had to be a little bit more organized ourselves in order to facilitate this and that included having the right discussion, the right virtual platform. Um, but I think it's really been worth that effort. Um, let me go ahead and stop here just in the interest of time. Um, I'll, I'll stop and see if there's questions. Thank you. Thank you to Keith and Sarah um, for sharing with us the, the ways in which your departments are engaging with the team up report. Um, Keith, I appreciate uh, the fact that you talked about the Vera Rubin Observatory because there was a question in the uh, Q&A about how um, a large collaboration could, could engage with the team up report. And I think you've provided 
sort of a way that a large collaboration could engage, in fact, with the report. Um, you talked a little bit about the um, discussion in your classroom um, about these these issues. And can you just tell us a little bit of more about how you structured that and, and maybe the experience that happened there? Sure. So I, I sort of prefaced this discussion by actually talking about it on the very first day of class, not holding the discussion on that day, but making it clear that this was going to be a theme throughout the semester, that this was important. Um, and I made sure to provide uh, several readings in advance. So the, the team up report for one, um, but several other readings as well. And I tried to select from a, a, a variety of different sources. What really struck me was the really wide range of the students in terms of their previous thinking on this subject coming into the discussion. It was very clear that there were some students that this was very, very new to them in, in, in many different ways and in, in, in terms of their comments, the types of questions that they asked. And then there were many students who you know, had thought about this much more and I, I came away from the discussion. I, I, I was nervous going into it because I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't sure how I might handle you know some uncomfortable situations that might come up. And overall, I felt like it was really important that I did this. And I, I feel like for many students, they wanted a forum. They wanted they wanted a place to have these discussions. And I really tried to tell them that I needed their partnership. That I needed I needed their help. You know that I, I could say my part as an instructor but that it was essential to have the cooperation and the support of the students in order to make this meaningful you know, for the department and really saying that they were gonna be future leaders, right? I mean, I really emphasized to them that you know, they, are the, they are the future and that this is a skill just like learning other, any other skill in physics. Yeah, that's an excellent approach. Thank you so much. Sarah, um, you talked about, you know that University of Maryland is a very large department. Very large. Um, <laughs> very, very large department. And you even alluded to the fact that some of, some of the faculty didn't even know that they were featured in uh, the team up report. And I'm wondering if your, uh, your group had considered how to tackle changing the culture in a department that's really large. And, you know, there may be faculty that are disconnected. Uh, in that sort of thing. So I'm wondering if you thought about how culture change could happen in such a department. So Arlene, you know, I, I, I'm embarrassed to admit, but but we, we did, we, we discussed this a bit and we, we do have a, a separate committee for, for climate change. And, and but I, I do think it was true that we, we felt more comfortable working on you know, more concrete things like working on fundraising and working on recruitment. That, that's the hardest problem. It's the most important problem, the climate, and it's also the hardest problem. I mean, we did look for any signs that we have a particularly bad climate, and we, we, you know, we didn't. We did review well in the thing. Our student services group is excellent, and, and they're really trying to make many resources uh, available to, to help all, all sorts of students and especially minority and black students. Mm -hmm. And so we have tend to segregate this into our student services. It's just something a large department can do, right? Mm -hmm. But it, 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 may, it may not be the best thing. And it is something we have to look at it at the longer term because it is the most important question even if it doesn't seem the, the easiest to implement. Yeah, very tough. Um, we actually just got a question for you and I don't know you may or may not know the answer to this, Sarah. Does Maryland allow the use of race in regards to university scholarships? Um, California just rejected overturning the ban on affirmative action, so our state school cannot directly target black students. Um, do you have any strategies for how to circumvent this, such as by creating so this is why we wanted to work, reach out to the local community colleges. You know, Maryland gets a lot of feed in from the community colleges. Right. And uh, Prince George's Community College is in a predominantly black county. And so we would like to reach out to them because any student who has like, I think it's a B average, uh, automatically can get submission to the University of Maryland. 
Uh, oh. So this is one of the things that we're looking at uh, as, as a way to target it. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, we may have some time. We have a, about five minutes to answer some questions that maybe we didn't get, get to early on. So let's see. Um, Can the speakers recommend, any of the speakers can answer this. Can the speakers recommend specific resources for learning how to implement effective and inclusive classroom teaching styles in the digital format, including the appropriate way to address social and racial unrest in the classroom? So this is about the virtual world. May I take a stab at that? Please. So although I was not one of the formal panelists, I, like most of us in academia, have been struggling to figure out how to use online platforms and technologies to deliver the highest quality of instruction that we can. Mm -hmm. And so the, this past summer, I actually taught a summer course uh, with students spread around the world, it turns out. And so I've learned a few things. Uh, the first thing, uh, which is actually independent of the platform, is to build a, is basically the people skills, the things that we that we actually heard touched upon in a number of the presentations. That as instructors, you, you must obviously you must strive for excellence in your knowledge base, but you must also strive to make sure that your students get the sense that you are on their side, that you have their backs, as the expression goes. And so this is a, this is also a skill that one can develop. Most of us who start off as physicists are are kind of, well, not, you know, we're, uh, we're shy, is <laughs> the one way to say it. And so the, uh, the, the ability to reach out and across barriers doesn't come naturally to us, but it is a skill that we can work on, as I have found in my life. And so I urge, uh, especially young physicists, physicists who seem so anxious to make a difference in the world, to think about that part of your development also. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else? Uh, I would add that, um, you know, uh, particularly undergraduates and, and at the very beginning of their career, they are looking to us for what is a physicist and what do physicists do? And so I think we underestimate our, um, our influence on them in the sense that um, if we go into the classroom and say, what it means to be a physicist is to learn collaborative skills, to learn that you're going to learn the most if you are in community and partnership with the others in this class. And so I think our humanities faculty members have been good at this for a long time, that is actually building a community in the classroom. Um, and if we hold that, as a, if we hold that as, as a central and important thing and say, this is what physicists do, which is actually true, um, and we cultivate those skills in the students from the beginning, I think that uh, then when higher stakes moments come up, you can work, you can go back to that foundation, reinforce it and say, well, are we acting in the spirit of the community? Are we acting in the best interest of everyone in the class? Um, and then you set that norm, whether it's online or, or, or in person. Thank you, Mary. I'll um, take a stab at addressing the, the question. And I was going through my computer looking for notes, but early on uh, with the move to online, there was a set of webinars that were put out. And I'm sorry, I can't give you the details of um, the outfit, the organization that did uh, sponsor those, but it did talk about inclusive pedagogy in the virtual environment. And so that, I think that you, if uh, maybe a search of those webinars would be able to help and talk about that. Now, addressing uh, uh, racial inequalities uh, in the context of um, physics, what I would suggest there is, um, I would hope that there is a, a strong diversity, equity and inclusion division a department or, or otherwise units at your university and a partnership with them would, would be able to help you um, 
in in designing whatever whatever engagement you would like. Um, our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, division at Rowan University had uh, put on a entire series of workshops that included panelists that were students, faculty, and staff, as well as community members, church leadership, uh, and other faith-based organization leadership. And this series of about four or five workshops uh, took place virtually. Uh, in the in the time period just following the um, social justice unrest in the summer. Now those types of activities uh, sponsored at the university can can help you uh, to connect with and to to sort of uh, have have a, a a positive way a productive way to um, to address these topics. I hope that helps in some way. It's a really tough issue, and I think I, I tried to express that in my in my statement, my 15-minute statement. But but it, it's something that shouldn't really be ignored. Thank you, all of you. Um, I think we have um, time for maybe one more question, one, two at the most. Um, can anyone give suggestions or examples for how leaders and departments can follow up on cases where they may have done something that furthered the impression that certain people do not belong? One example from earlier was the condemnation of writing without acknowledging the issues underlying the behavior. So condemning the fact that um, people are out there protesting in the streets or what have you. Um, without really taking a moment to think about the underlying issues. What was the question though? I, I got the issue, the topic, I didn't get the can question. You, can, can someone give a suggestion on how to, to basically follow up on that when someone, when a leader knows that they have maybe done something that may have made someone feel like they do not belong? And as the oldest person here, may I take a shot at that? Sure. Okay, so let me get my camera back on. So this is actually, a, a, you know, for young people, of course, this is a very complicated and difficult thing because, uh, you know, I think I remember when I was young and trying to become a tenured faculty member. And one has all sorts of concerns about making sure that you don't damage your career because I told people I've never met anyone who went into physics as they thought they were going to become a millionaire. People go into physics because they love the doing of physics and the challenge that nature presents us. And so we're obviously very concerned that if we're that passionately involved in the discipline that we want to have the opportunity to do it a lifetime. And I'm approaching 70, so I've, I've been lucky in some ways. But the thing that I have seen sometimes works is if you're a young person and you have a, a, an older colleague that you can discuss some uh, strategies uh, that not necessarily with that particular individual, but say a third individual, that a leader that's actually uh, in some sense uh, given a micro aggression. The best thing that I know is to actually find out who else in the group also perceives this as a problem and to find and to see if you can actually get, a, a, you know, a slightly older colleague who might have tenure, for example, you might bring it to their attention and say, what is it that I can do? Or what is, better yet, what is it that we can do? Or can you help me? Because I think most physicists really do want to be helpful to their younger colleagues. Thanks, Jim. Tabitha, did you want to say something? Um, I thought that was a really good response by Jim. And I think I, I will leave it there. OK, good. So I think we should probably wrap up. And I'm going to attempt to wrap us up for the webinar, we have about six minutes left. So I wanna thank you all for these very thoughtful questions and thank you to our speakers, all of you, uh, for giving us a really a good sense of the ongoing work uh, that's happening to understand and improve the experiences and outcomes for African-American students. Next slide. So now that you've, you've heard about an overview of the team of report, you've heard about this new study that's looking at the impacts of the COVID-19 uh, closures on black physics students. 
You've heard a little bit about the Team Up workshops, the upcoming workshops to support departments in making change. Um, and you've heard a little bit about how two different departments are engaging with this work. Next slide. So the question is, what will you do? And more specifically, what will you do to help us, the community, double the number of physics and astronomy bachelor's degrees earned by African-Americans by 2030? Next slide. The fact is, it will take each of us, all of us doing our part to turn around decades of African-American underrepresentation to address the financial challenges that these students face and to ameliorate the unsupportive environments that are found in many of our departments and institutions of higher education. It's going to take clarity, commitment, and courage to change the culture of physics and astronomy to become places where African American students not only survive, but thrive and can step into the fullness of their scientific prowess to solve the problems of science and society. Next slide. And we've begun the journey down that path. Many of your professional societies have created their own individual programs and partnered with one another to support these goals and more importantly, to support you in your diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Next slide. Now, as you heard earlier, we're planning these team up implementation workshops and we're accepting um, applications that are due December 4th. So we're gonna be really focusing on African-American uh, student, physics and astronomy student outcomes for the workshops. Next slide. Um, so several of the physics and astronomy professional societies are working together on the disciplinary counterpart of the AAAS Sea Change Award called the Physics and Astronomy Sea Change Project. Um, and this is a project where uh, departments will do some deep reflection and self-assessment along DEI lines and uh, be eligible for award. So that the pilot for that is starting within a year. Um, and I encourage those of you who are interested in that to contact Alexis Knob, who's the project manager for that. Next slide, please. You heard us reference this earlier, the APS Inclusion, Diversity and Equity Alliance, APS IDEA is uh, it seeks to build a community of practice around diversity, equity, and inclusion in the physical sciences. And 98 organizational teams have been working with APS IDEA, learning how change happens in organizations and de developing theories of change to support their DEI goals. Next slide, please. And a few other DEI resources for you. The American Astronomical Society's Committee on the Status of Minorities in Astronomy blog, Astronomy in Color, is a wealth of knowledge around racial and social justice issues in astronomy um, and is chock full of resources and I highly recommend you check it out. Um, the AAS and APS conduct climate site visits where site visits teams are invited to uh, physics and astronomy departments to assess the climate for women and or people from underrepresented racial groups and LGBT plus uh, people. And they then provide a report to the department leadership and practical suggestions for improvement. Uh, the APS and AAPT have, the American Association of Physics Teachers have been engaged in the EP3 guide project, which when launched will provide guidance to departments as they self-assess um, and we'll also provide practical suggestions for implementing better practices in physics department in many aspects of physics programs, including DEI. So all of these resources, and there are many, many more, can be utilized to begin to address the culture of physics and astronomy and create a more supportive environment and educational experience for African-American students and ultimately for all. So next slide, please. I urge you to take action. Next, please. And as you do so, I wanna remind you that African-American students need specific supportive environments to persist in physics and astronomy, but they are not broken and they don't need fixing. 
to capture and sustain their interest in these fields and to see them through to the degree a culture of caring and commitment to their success must be cultivated and codified in our departments and communicated by those who are gatekeepers of the field. Next slide. So let's not let another two decades go by where we leave African-American students behind. The time is, is now for action. Next slide, please. So I wanna thank you on behalf of the APS and the AIP for attending this webinar. As I said, the uh, team up implementation workshops, you can find more information at aip.org slash team up workshops. And the Delta Phi webinar series will continue into 2021. Uh, and in February, there will be a special guest. So please stay tuned for that. And I wanna thank you again.